black thing go from left to right, and I thought, I'm going to die out here. No one's ever going to know. I couldn't believe what my eyeballs were showing me. I'll, I'll never forget how evil the eyes were. It was horrible. I mean, I've never seen nothing that evil. It ran towards me at, at a rate that I, I, I can't even explain. Turned and stared at me. And this look of, I just want to kill you. I want to say it was human, but it wasn't. He was, he, was, he was yelling at me to grab a gun, grab a gun. I was like, for what? He said, just grab a gun. And there's footprints all the way to the door of my house. It had went inside my garage all the way to the door. 911, what are you reporting? Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? Sure. Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. You're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Check us out online at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you've had an encounter, email me. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight. We'll be talking to Richard, and Richard had an encounter back in 1957, 58 in North Carolina when he was very young. He stumbled upon one of these creatures sleeping, and it's always bothered him to this day, and he has a hard time saying what he saw as far as being a Sasquatch, but uh, it's always bothered him, and him and I talked, and he wasn't really sure if he wanted to come on. I was like, ah, come on. Everyone says no. Uh, <laughs> and so Richard will be coming on and sharing his encounter. And then we'll be talking to Jeff. Now, Jeff has, this isn't Bigfoot related at all. I didn't even know where to begin with this uh, this story. Uh, this happened back in the 60s. And Jeff ran into, I guess, a witch. And just a lot of weird things started happening. And I was talking to Jeff and we were talking about screen memories and, you know, false memories you're given a lot of times when you're abducted. And I said, you know, would you come on, Jeff, and just talk about it? You know, I know it's not Bigfoot related, but uh, talk about how you were taken and, and some of the weird things that went on. And if you guys like it, I may do a part two with uh, Jeff and some of his other experiences he's had um, outside of what we'll talk about tonight. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Uh, Let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome Richard to the show. Richard, thanks for coming on. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah, I appreciate you being here. And I know your encounter took place many years ago uh, in North Carolina. If you would, Richard, would you just kind of wa- tell us what you were doing and, and what happened? Well, uh, this this was my childhood home. We were located in the, uh, the northwestern corner of North Carolina near the Virginia line. And uh, we, did, we lived in the foothills. And... Um, there was a forest behind our house. Uh, it was a vast expanse of just undeveloped woodlands, uh, thousands of acres. I don't know exactly how big it was. Uh, but uh, I started off with my father hunting when I was a little fella, and I followed him around through the woods. He was He was an amazing father. He had more patience with me than I can. I can tell, and uh, one of his favorite, one of his favorite guns as a young man, was a little Ithaca 20 gauge side by side shotgun, and I got this as a present from him. Oh, by the time I was 10 years old, and I followed him around in the woods, and he used to complain that I uh, 
poked him in the heels with the barrel of this gun, but I was afraid he would get too far ahead of me, so I walked real close to him. He never understood that, but we spent a lot of time together. Uh, by the time, I guess I was about 12 years old. Now, let's set the timeline here. I was born in 46, 1946. So when I was around 11, 12 years old, uh, that would have been 57, 1957, 58, 59 era. Uh, my dad had been out with me and taught me enough gun safety and so forth that he, uh, after much begging, he trusted me to uh, go squirrel hunting by myself. And uh, we walked we walked up in the mountain uh, behind our house and the first, first day he uh, took me around and showed me some uh, places that he thought would be productive squirrel territory and uh, he took his pocket knife and blazed some spots on the trees so I could find my way in and out of these places without having to call him, you know having to wait for him to come and get me at night. This was in uh, the fall. Let's see, squirrel season starts around September 15th. So when the season started opening, uh, came around, I ran home from school or rode the bus home from school, grabbed my little shotgun and took off to the woods. And uh, there was one place in particular that I really liked. Uh, in fact, I kind of adopted it as my favorite place to go sit in the woods, even when I wasn't hunting. And uh, it was a beautiful little place. For some reason, the timber in there wasn't cut. There were huge uh, beech trees. And they were, oh, I don't know, 15 inches through, uh, you know, in diameter. and. I don't know how tall, really, really tall. And uh, my path went down the ridge. There were two ridges that formed this little valley. And my path run down one of those ridges. And uh, when you walked into this little valley down there, uh, the canopy was so thick and the trees were so tall, it was like walking into a auditorium. And the little... Uh, Beach berries uh, in the fall of the year made it ideal territory for gray squirrels and birds and stuff. And even when I didn't see any squirrels, I enjoyed just staying around in this area, kind of like a little sanctuary. At the bottom, there was a um, a branch, a good-sized little stream that uh, ran around the bottom of the uh, this area. And the years gone by. Uh, there had been uh, logging trails put in this area, and there was a bridge across the little brook that crossed over into a different area that had been cut over uh, several years before. And it was quite a contrast because you go from the very, very tall trees into a field that had been cut over, and... Uh, the underbrush had grown up real thick uh, to the point you could hardly get through it. Anyway, one evening I went over to my little uh, beech tree uh, valley and it was extremely quiet. And after what I thought was a, a sufficient time standing around, walking around in this area, uh, I decided to go into across this little bridge into this territory that I wasn't that familiar with. <clears throat> and uh, it, it was kind of hard going. There was an, an old logging trail or game trail that kind of circled around the bottom of, a, of an incline. And you could walk around there. And uh, I did. And of course, it was so, it was just so quiet. There was nothing stirring. I turned around and started to go back through the path that would eventually take me home. Oh, I had been two or 300 yards up in the woods. 
And when I came back down to the little stream and started to cross over uh, back into the path that would take me home, I heard this strange noise. Uh, it sounded like a squirrel scratching in the... I've seen squirrels scratch in the leaves looking for stuff that had been buried in you know, time gone by. And birds would scratch in the leaves looking for worms and uh, bugs and stuff to eat. And I could hear the leaves rattling. Now, it was a really quiet evening, and this noise stood out to my attention. It was making a different noise than I was used to, but it uh, made me very, very curious as to what was making this noise. But it was out, it was, oh, 50 feet off of this little path I was walking on, and it was really thick briars and weeds and little bushes and stuff uh, it was very difficult to uh, get through this stuff there wasn't a path walking way in there but that's where the noise was so taking my time and trying to be as quiet as I could I uh, made a little path I made a lot of noise getting in there more than I wanted to but as quiet as I could be I sneaked off into this uh, undergrowth, and uh, I kept hearing this noise. It it was a very rhythm, you know, rhythm noise. It kind of it was just kind of it was you know it kind of stopped and it would go and then it would stop and it would go, but it was on regular intervals and I couldn't figure it out, so I kept forcing my way through the underbrush and uh the this overgrowth was as tall as i was and i was 12 years old when this happened i got pretty deep in this brush and i tar parted uh some of the taller stuff and got to where i could see in front of me and I was rather shocked because what I saw was this huge animal uh, embedded on the ground down in these weeds. And I got quite a shock because I had not, I knew what was in the area. I knew there were foxes and bobtail, uh, I mean, uh, bobcats and squirrels and birds and so forth. Uh, we were pretty limited as far as variety of game i could see but this thing looked like i don't know it was huge it, it reminded me of a the only thing i could think of at that time was a cow uh it was laying uh down in the weeds i could see its back and uh that's about all it was a cinnamon brown color kind of reddish brown and uh, I'm standing there with my head sticking through the weeds, oh, within three or four foot of this thing. And the noise I had heard that drew me to it was this creature was sound asleep. And the noise of the leaves was its breathing. It was laying there with its face down, I guess. I never saw its head, but it was laying there. Uh, flat down on the ground, feet and legs and everything else tucked up under it. So all I could see was the surface of its back. Now, this thing was healthy. It was big. And uh, I don't know, it looked to be six, 700 pounds of animal. I had no idea what it was. Well, standing there trying to figure it out, I'm excited. I've seen something that I wasn't expecting. And I couldn't figure out what it was. And so I started running through the repertoire of my memory, you know, what it could be. The only thing I could think of was I had seen, you know, cattle, uh, this cinnamon brown color out in pastures before. And, uh, well, maybe that's somebody's 
uh, somebody's cow. Uh, no, it was, it looked to me like it was bigger than the cow. Um, I thought, well, I'll get a little closer. And so I studied what I could see very intently. I could see no legs. I could see no feet. Uh, I couldn't see its head. I knew where the head was because it was breathing through the weeds and coming out pretty close to my uh, right leg. But uh, I couldn't see anything. And as noisy as I'd been getting in there, I was a little surprised I hadn't waked this thing up. But uh, after some amount of time, well, it seemed like several minutes. I'm sure that the whole episode didn't last oh, a full minute. But uh, I was standing there looking this thing within three or four foot of me. I had no idea what it was. So I decided it had to be somebody's bull got loose. And uh, so I thought, well, I, I haven't waked it up yet. I better back out of here. But it was noisy for me to move. So what I had with me was a double barrel 20 gauge shotgun. But the only ammunition I had with me was uh, number six bird shot. <laughs> uh, well, something that big, I don't know that my shot going to be very effective on it. So I pulled my shotgun up in front of me, kind of across my chest, you know, ready to mount it if I had to. And I thought, well, if it wakes up and it's angry with me, whatever it is, I'll aim for the eyes. I figured, you know, with birdshot, I could, at that range, I could, uh, I could blind it if nothing else. And that would slow it down and give me a chance to get away from it if it couldn't see me but uh so very slowly one step at a time i backed out of the underbrush and got back out onto this little path that i had uh walked in on and then it struck me uh just popped in my head that well you haven't crossed any any fences you you know, you're impo it's impossible for you to be in somebody's pasture. And I didn't know of anybody who lived around there that would have would have had cattle running around in the woods uh, in that area. I couldn't think. I knew kind of where I was, and I didn't know of anybody that had, you know, had um, cattle that would be that close in there. But uh, nonetheless, I backed out, got back on the path where I could walk pretty quietly. And uh, oh, once I got 100 foot away from it, I kind of studied over what I had seen. I signed, that it, I signed in my mind uh, that it had to be cattle of some sort. Because now this is 1957-58. At this point in my education, my career... I had never heard of a Bigfoot. The Gimlin film didn't come out until 76, and this is 57, 58. So as I think back about it, the only large creature I had ever heard of was the abominable snowman. <laughs> I knew we weren't anywhere close to that. Yeah. I tried to assign it being a bear, but then there were no bears in this area of the country had never heard of one and besides that area of north carolina the only bears we had uh were black bears and this thing was way bigger than a little black bear uh they averaged what two or three hundred pounds i guess maybe yeah a huge one would be but um i wanted to ask you richard what what did the hair look like when you were looking at the hair well that's the one thing that kind of throws me because uh it wasn't shaggy. It, it looked like a pretty, a pretty smooth coat of hair. Now, all I could see was its back. That's all I could ever see. It was covered thoroughly. I could see no skin. Uh, it was just a, well, I can tell you the color. Uh, I later saw an orangutan in the zoo. You know that orangey-brown color of an orangutan? Yeah. 
Yeah. It was really close to that in color. And the hair was not as long uh, as an orang. I guess it, it looked to be like inch, inch and a half, uh, fairly smooth uh, coat of hair. But, you know, based on the fact there was no, no cattle I knew of around there. But I figured somebody's bull got out. And I had found it wandering around in the woods. And then I thought, well, this thing was trying its best to hide. It had, I looked to see how it got in there. I mean, it was just like if you dropped a rock in the middle of tall grass, you know. Uh, there was no path in or out of this concealment spot it was in. And the, uh, the brush and the briars and so forth. Uh, were very, uh, they were not, wa wa excuse me, they were not mashed down around it. You know, the cover came right up to the edges of this thing. Uh, I couldn't see how it got in there. There was no path into it. Uh, I thought, well, you know, cattle walking in there, you could see a path where it walked in, but I couldn't find that. So, uh, yeah, it's just, fascinating. Makes you wonder what you what it was. You know, it sounds like one of these things. I've heard of people <laughs> they come up on them and they're like in the fetal position and um, just in a lot of weird positions when they sleep. There was a guy in Texas. He stumbled across one. Uh, he accidentally woke it up. It roared at him and it took off running. Um, but thank God this thing didn't get up. Whatever it was, because that twenty two wouldn't have done you very much. Wouldn't have been very much help. <laughs> Well, I was, I wasn't frightened out of my mind, but my heart beat really fast because I was faced with something I didn't know what I was looking at. Uh, and uh, thanks the good Lord. Well, my dad always told me that the good Lord looks after children and fools, and I probably fell in that category that day. Uh, if that thing had waked up, and roared at me or uh, challenged me, it probably would have got me because I may have passed out. I have no idea what would have happened, but uh, I was just lucky. I got away from it and didn't wake up. I smelled no odors. Uh, I heard no noise other than this snoring. And uh, on the way home, I thought, well, what am I going to do about this? Well, I was afraid, uh, not afraid to tell my dad, but I knew if I told him, uh, he would think I'd made it up or, you know, if he knew of something that size in the woods, he would have told me about it. My dad, pretty smart fella. He knew what was going on and, uh, he had never mentioned anything like this to me. Uh, so, you know, it was kind of a, damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. So yeah. I thought, well, I'll have to be real quiet about this because if he thinks I got into something that I shouldn't have been, uh, he might take my shotgun away from me. Well, that was my prized possession at that time. So I decided to be quiet about that. And besides, if that thing had gotten up and I had uh, <laughs> considered shooting somebody's cow or bull, uh, he would have been very disappointed in me. I knew I would not have been allowed to go back to the woods by myself for a long time. So I was just quiet. Now, I went to school in elementary school with some other guys that we kind of, you know, bragged back and forth to each other. Yeah, I got two squirrels lit yesterday afternoon after school and back and forth. And I thought, well, if I tell any of them my story, one, they'll make fun of me forever for being afraid of a cow. So I promptly just filed it in the back of my memory and never told anybody. In fact, uh, this is probably the second or second or third time I've told anybody in my life. Uh, in fact, I forgot it. Uh, I'll, I just dismissed it out of my mind. Uh, for years and years because, you know, at 16, I got my driver's license. And shortly after that, I discovered girls and 
I didn't hunt for a few years there, and I had other priorities, and I just kind of dismissed it. Uh, in fact, I had forgotten all about this occurrence until I started listening to uh, your uh, your stories or your videos on YouTube. And uh, I read or heard of uh, another instance that a guy found one down in the brush, and it was sound asleep, and I thought, that sounds very familiar. And then it kind of, I kind of figured out that maybe that was the same thing I got involved with many years ago. Now, I'm 72 now, so this memory is roughly 60 years old. And I've told you as near as I can remember yeah, uh, I, what happened as it happened. Yeah, and I appreciate you sharing it, Richard. I mean, I really do. It's, uh, it's a cool account. Um, what do you think Sasquatch is? Richard, I'm sure you've given it some thought. What's your opinion? Well, I'm still not real sure. Uh, that was my only encounter, and standing there looking at it, I knew that it was a flesh and blood creature. Uh, it was alive because it was resting. It was sleeping. Uh, now, this was in the afternoon. Well, I got out of school at 3, so this would have been 4.30 or 5 o'clock uh, in the afternoon. But as far as I could tell, it was just a live creature. It never occurred to me that it could be anything else. And I really, uh, as to whether they exist or not, I've been a little jaded through the years with, uh, you know, all the, these people on TV, the, I, what is it, finding Sasquatch, you know, yeah. when they go out and play recordings and beat on trees and, I thought, well, I'm not the greatest hunter that's ever been, but, if I wanted to find an elusive creature, I don't think, uh, you know, broadcasting right. squeals and beating on trees would be the way I would go about trying to find one. It really is a mystery, and it, it, it would be nice to know what they are. And, um, you know, I know this is 60 years ago, but, you know, it's a, it's a very interesting account. It's not the first time I've heard of someone, you know, and you, you would think something so elusive you wouldn't be able to stumble up on it while it's sleeping. But I've heard many accounts like that. I mean, a handful of them where they've stumbled up on these things sleeping. And they're usually in areas how you describe, you know, a lot of brush around them, kind of hidden. You'd almost have to trek your way in to get to them. You know, it's they're so far in and buried down. And the way it was sleeping, too, um, I think you would have noticed if it would have been a cow. And I don't know if cows snore. I, I'm not a farmer. but uh, Well, that was, a, that was another thought. Uh, the only, now we didn't have cattle. My my family didn't, but I, a lot of the guys I ran around with lived on a farm, and I was familiar with cows in their pasture. Uh, the only dangerous part I had been been uh, exposed to was some of the bull. You know, artificial insemination wasn't a big thing then that I knew of. Most farmers that had any cattle. Uh, kept a bull, and a lot of times uh, these bulls could be uh, real cantankerous, and they'd chase you if you got in a pasture. I, they'd probably kill you if they got a chance, but that was the only danger I could think of about it. Um, and two, that was one-time experience. I've never been anywhere close to one since then uh, that I know of. Well, there is one other thing. Uh, I guess it was about 1980. I had grown up and uh, moved away. Uh, out of, you know, I got married and moved out of home. But uh, I went by to see my dad, as I did quite often. And uh, he said, I got something more to tell you. And, of course, I would listen to anything he said. Um he had been back up in that same mountain, uh, and he was exploring. He found things in that mountain that I never saw, but he was exploring uh, very remote parts of that mountain, and he said, uh, 
you know, I started looking around uh, where I was, and there was some, he used one of his famous sayings, I forgot what it was, that he was in a Algomi holler, whatever that means. I think that's where you have to carry the sunshine in and the bucket, it's so dark. <laughs> he said, you know, the thought occurred to me that there was things in that, there could be things in that mountain that I'd never heard of. And uh, he had a little uh, Colt Woodsman 22 pistol that he carried with him during most of these explorations. And uh, he was very proficient with this weapon. But it was a 22 semi-automatic pistol. And he said he got uh, pensive enough that he took that pistol out of his holster and carried it in his hand so it would be easily accessed if he needed it. And he carried it in his hand uh, on his trek back home. And uh, my dad was a, well, he was my hero, but he was a he-man. He, uh, he grew up rather poorly, and he, he had three brothers. Well, usually what they ate for dinner was what my dad or one of his uh, brothers brought home from the woods. And they lived kind of in the middle of a, uh, well, we lived in the foothills, and they had a little house that was out in the woods a good bit off, you know, on a little dirt trail, wasn't on a highway. But what they went to the field and brought home, squirrels, rabbits, whatever it was, a lot of times was what they had to eat. So, I mean, he was a pretty proficient woodsman and knew a lot about the woods. But for him to, uh, I've never known him to be afraid of anything. Uh, the man was in World War II for four years, and he went through uh, the worst battles in the Pacific. He was there at Midway and Iwo Jima and several other battles. and. I've never known him to be afraid of much at all. But for him to get uh, nervous enough to take that gun out of his holster and carry it, I, I, didn't, I didn't think much about it when he was telling me this. But afterwards, I thought, I wonder what that man saw. Something, something he saw or uh, something moved and he didn't know what it was. Something happened to frighten him. To make him do that, uh, and I never got to ask him what it was. This was in early 1980s, and uh, I lost him in 1985. Uh, so oh, I never got the chance to. Uh, I never got the chance to uh, explore it with him after after I woke up and realized what he was telling me. Yeah, but uh, makes you wonder. Makes you wonder what he saw and what he experience you know he comes from that generation of guys to where not much shakes him up not much uh it was a different time different generation you know so it does make you wonder what he saw or what he heard that told him to pull that gun and walk his way out um but you know it's well, he was pretty proficient with that little weapon yeah i, I can imagine kill something yeah very large with it but um he was good with it yeah i can imagine well, Richard, I appreciate you coming on and sharing the encounters. I really enjoyed talking with you. Well, now you understand all I've told you is the truth as best I can remember it. I can't tell you that I saw a Sasquatch, but I told you what happened. You can make up. Well, thank you for having me, Wes. It's an honor. Yeah, no, the honor's mine. And, you know, I was thinking about us talking yesterday and some of the weird things that happened to you. You know, I have so many questions, and I'm I'm fascinated by it. Um, if you would, would you just kind of start from the beginning? Um, tell us how all this started. I know there was an abduction when you were younger, uh, but if you yeah. would, just kind of walk us into everything that happened to you. Well, it began when I was five years old. Uh, I My mother was pregnant and about ready to deliver, and I woke up in the middle of the night, and there were... Uh, four small men standing around my my bed. Uh, I don't remember much about what they looked like other than they had uh, large heads 
and I was uh, telepathically informed not to be afraid and that we were, they were going to teach me to fly. And uh, I consented, and with that, they levitated me up. Uh, they were at the four corners of my body, the four corners of my shoulders and my feet. And uh, we floated, I floated down the stairs, second floor of the house, out onto the porch. And they said, now we're going to fly down the street. And there was a little hillock about a half a block away, and I was about 20 feet off the, the ground looking down. And we landed on this little grassy hillock. And then they said, now we're going to fly up. And they, they pointed up, and there was a, uh, some kind of a craft illuminated. And uh, that's the last I recall. Well, just at that time, I developed uh, a severe case of the measles. Now, I had had the measles the summer before. And you only get uh, the, I don't know what to, the, the German measles is the short variety, the two-week variety, I don't know what it's called, but I got it again. And I had a near-death experience. I was very ill. And I say near-death experience, I nearly died, is what I should say. And when I came out of it, I was uh, extremely weak. And uh, there were presents that were given to me. I don't, didn't remember any child ever getting presents being sick, but it was because the word went out that I was uh, I could die, and my mo my sister who was two years older, Bonnie, begged my mother to allow us to blow bubbles. I had some been given some of those uh, bubbles you blow through a little uh, round wand and they stream out. So we went outside on the porch. I was so weak I just flopped down on the on the swing, and Bonnie began to blow bubbles, but. I thought, boy, that, they're crappy bubbles. They break right away. So I said to Bonnie, it's a shame that the bubbles aren't good. They, they start, but then they break. And she said, what are you talking about? The air is full of bubbles. Well, at that moment, I realized that I wasn't seeing what she could see. And I didn't have any idea what was going on. I didn't even think about it. I just chalked it up to an experience I didn't understand. My brother was born two weeks later, and uh, back in those days, they said he had a—he was severely mentally retarded. Uh, I, I, I'm a disability rights advocate, and I, I would say he's severely—he was severely cognitively disabled. But in that same summer, Wes, on our little street, there was a boy that had a terrible accident with gasoline and set himself on fire, terribly disfigured. There was a boy that uh, had a complete nervous breakdown. There was a child that developed polio. And there was a boy that developed a, uh, a bone disease called osteomyelitis. And so there was this concentration of childhood disease. And of course, I, will, I only put that together much later on. But Suffice to say that my life changed dramatically. My parents saw that I was having trouble seeing, took me to an optometrist, and he said, the boy, is he wants to wear glasses. There's nothing wrong with his vision. So they were told I was pretending I couldn't see. Now, he, he couldn't see that there was anything wrong with my eyes because I have a very, very rare eye condition. And at that point, it had not begun to... Uh, mar the cornea or the, the retina the retina in this condition just a second we we'll get a drink of tea here the retina in this condition develops pigment that's con the condition is called retinitis pigmentosa and there are 100,000 Americans with it there are 500 forms of the disease and I have an extremely rare form of the disease apparently one researcher said, told me that the measles can kick in the genetic predisposition to this condition. Uh, so if that's true, then I had a, the, the genetic condition 
the measles triggered it and I began to, to go blind. It's a lifetime of, of vision loss. And Jeff, you go blind, totally blind in your 50s. Can I ask you a quick question? And forgive me for interrupting you, but I, I'm, I'm fascinated by this whole thing. You know, a lot of times when people say they're abducted, it's very much how you describe. I mean, I've heard that time and time again. I'm not really an expert on the UFO abductions, but I've listened to many witnesses. And they describe yes. being levitated and let out of the house. And do you think that actually happened? Or do you think that uh, there was a memory that was implanted? Because I don't know if I've ever seen anyone float out of a house. But yet you talk to a lot of people who've been abducted, and they'll describe it exactly how you're describing it. What are your thoughts on I, that? I'm a very keen observer of my you know, my consciousness, my memory. I, I believe it or not, I remember circumcision. So I I remember things vividly, going back to near near birth. Uh, I've been gifted with a, a a remarkable memory, and this happened. It was a physical experience. Now, from the point of being on the hillock and going up into the craft, I don't remember that. I don't remember anything about that. So, yeah, there's a, a, a writer named Whitley Strieber that, uh, or Strieber, I don't know how it's pronounced, uh, who says that when we have abduction experiences, often we have what's called a mask memory or a screen memory that is put into our head to block what really happened. And I think that, uh, now I'll tell you, uh, as we go on with this, uh, my, my saga, uh, I, I can tell you an experience that I, I would bet was a, a screen memory. But that, I don't, I would think I, it was real. I, I think that uh, I was abducted. And I appreciate you answering it. It's it's uh, again, forgive me. It's a new topic for me, but I'm I'm fascinated by no. it. Um, and don't, so don't uh, apologize. Well, I appreciate that. So you get you get me measles twice, which generally never happens. You start going blind, and what's kind of the the next episode in in the saga? Well, in high school, I began to. I I was a child of the '60s. I was involved in civil rights, I began, actually blindness began to impact me in a, in a positive way when I realized that I could play instruments by ear. I was taking piano lessons. Uh, the teacher again was told I was pretending, couldn't see. And when he realized a year and a half later that I'd been memorizing the music and playing it back, but not seeing the, the music, he refused to teach me from that point on. But I had had that early experience, and it subliminally taught me that I could play by ear. So I began playing the ukulele and then the guitar, and I've taught myself to play 20 instruments. And I made my life as a musician for many years, uh, developing materials for schools and families and hospice and uh, performing them and uh, selling my materials and, and giving them away. But uh, the next thing that happened was, as a teenager involved in the counterculture in Cleveland in the 60s, I was introduced to a, uh, uh, a very simply prepared, stapled into a, a file folder, something called the, uh, the, the Shropel Lessons, Shropel. And there were lessons about telepathy, leaving your body, telekinesis, moving objects at a distance, and so forth. And I, I began really wanting to learn to do those things. I had been involved in the Christian church and turned off by the hypocrisy of the church, uh, believed very much in Jesus, but not, not in the church. And I, my attention began to be turned toward the psychic, toward paranormal, toward uh, the tricks. <laughs> And I, my intention was to learn to do that stuff. Well, I, I went to college for a couple of quarters. I was very dis, uh, discouraged by my life. My brother wound up being institutionalized at age nine in a barbaric 
institution. I've spent much of my life, uh, just not much of my life, I, as an adult, I've I developed a documentary about state institutions. I've written many songs about them, and uh, I still am an advocate for the inclusion of people with disabilities into community life. So I was, uh, I felt like I was stuck. My parents, because of my, my brother's condition, became alcoholics. So in 1968, I climbed into a, a car with some friends and off we went to California. And after a few days in the apartment of the friend where we wound up, I began hitchhiking alone with my backpack and guitar. And I was seeking a psychic teacher. I, I, my intentions, one, one of the things I, I do wanna say is that our intentions about everything in life are extraordinarily important. What we intend, what, the, what our, our focus, our beliefs, our desires are, will shape our lives. And my intention was to find a psychic teacher. Well, I wound up in a commune in the Santa Cruz Mountains with a, a number of strangers. And they said, there's a woman coming who is a witch. Beware of her. Leave her alone. I ran through a plate glass door. I got high. I, I, I went running back to climb onto the back of a motorcycle for a ride. And I didn't see the door. And I, I ran through the glass I, and terribly cut my hand. I was taken to uh, the Santa Cruz Hospital. And it was sewn up. Went back three days later and had gotten infected. It was horrible. And he said, if this doesn't break and start draining by itself, in three days, I'll have to open it up and clean it out. So my hand was bandaged. I was in terrible pain. And in comes into this house, Audrey, was her name. Audrey Mars, like the planet. Well, I was told to stay away from her, but I had nowhere to go. I was just in the house, and I was wounded, so I, I was pretty laid up. She said, what happened to your hand? I told her. She said, does it hurt? I said, it hurts terribly, yes. And she said, let me see it. She put her hands around it, didn't touch it, closed her eyes, and the throbbing, I, I, it was every 10 seconds there was a throb of pain, eased and stopped. There, there was no more pain. And I said, what did you do? And she said, I healed you. That's simple. Well, I, I thought, this is pretty amazing. I don't know what she did, but I would like to know how to do what she did. And two nights later, I was going into Santa Cruz to hear one of the guys play guitar at a bar. And on the way back, driving in a truck, we came upon a deer that had been hit by the car in front of us. It was uh, in the middle of the road. I got out. I wanted to help the deer and put it in the back of the truck and get a vet. And, well, they, no one would help. And the deer, you could see its back legs were paralyzed. It scrabbled away from me. Well, they refused to help. I was helpless to do anything, so we went back to the house. Audrey came out of the room, her bedroom, and said, what's wrong? I said, what do you mean, what's wrong? She said, the light kept going on. I'm getting your name. What's wrong? I told her about the deer, and she said, okay, let's go. Uh, who else wants to help? There was a Native American woman that had given birth to a couple twins. She said, I'll help. So the three of us climbed into a car, and on the way to the deer, Audrey said, animals communicate telepathically. I'll send it pictures. Come, when, when I say, join me, then come up to the deer. So she got out of the car, put her hand up in a, like the, the, her palm exposed, began talking to the deer, got to it, knelt down. The animal was completely quiet. She said, come now. We walked up, unrolled a sleeping bag, lifted the deer onto the sleeping bag, put it in the front seat of a car, drove it back to the house. She went in and the same guys that wouldn't help carried the deer inside. 
and put it on her bed. A German shepherd climbed up and lay next to the deer. A cat climbed up and lay next to the German shepherd. And Audrey and I, there was a circle of the five beings. And as long as one of us was touching the deer, it was absolutely peaceful. It drank water. It was alert. It was watching us. And it began to quiet. At about 5.30, it died. 5.30 a.m. So the deer dies. We bury it. And she says, let me teach you about plants. So we go out, and she shows me about you can put your hand behind a fern, and if your intention is love for the plant, the plant, the fern will move toward your hand. And I, I did that. She did it. I did it. I said, I want, I want to know what she knows. So I went. In, we went out for breakfast, and uh, I went into the restroom, and I thought, oh, I haven't told her what I want. And I said, I, I focused. I want two eggs over easy, bacon, an English muffin, coffee, and orange juice. Came out. She said, the, the waitress came. I didn't know what you wanted, so I ordered two eggs over easy, bacon, English muffin, coffee, and orange juice. And I was grinning like a kid. She said, what's wrong? What is I said, I sent you that thought. That is what I wanted. I, I, I sent you that telepathically. She got black with anger. She said, don't you ever get into my head again. Well, I thought telepathy was a great thing. Now I'm seeing from her point of view that I was in her head. Well, I passed that off and she said, look, I've got a place down in San Diego. Uh, there's some other young people there. You want to come with us? Want to come with me and visit? Well, I had nothing going on where I was, so I took a few things. I left my backpack um, and sleeping bag. I didn't think I'd be gone long. And off we went. Well, it was a, a wonderful place. It was an adobe. It had been a, a, an, an adobe uh, house or, or stable, perhaps. But there were outbuildings, and I became member our member of the, the uh, firewood cutting crew. And at night she would, and that was basically me and another fellow and Audrey. And at night she would read to us from, or read to me, from spiritual books of all kinds and talk to me about how one religion creates the next religion by virtue of the intention of the people, how they focus, the, the thought forms they create. And she said that she was a very powerful human being that extraterrestrials control, wanted to control so as to control the planet. And she claimed that extraterrestrials lived on the emotional suffering of the human race, that they didn't have developed feelings, but they were like vampires living on horror. Uh, pain, suffering. So they kept the earth in a state of turmoil. And since then, I've learned that the, it, it's the reptilian extraterrestrials uh, for whom that is true. But there are numerous other uh, ETs that have been involved with the earth since, well, for time in memoriam, that the different races on the earth represent different uh, ET races, but that we are uh, a unique and wonderful planet, rich with resources that they want. And they particularly want, at least the, the reptilians, our emotional suffering. Well, Audrey and I uh, would go to the, the beach and she would say, in that, now, at this point, I have low vision, but I have vision. With binoculars, I could see normally, and I have binoculars with me. She would say, look at that. There'd be a light in the sky. It would come down. 
larger and larger in the shape of a saucer and go into the ocean. I saw that. I, I can't explain it, but I saw that. And she would, she said that she was able to communicate with these extraterrestrials by what she called yelling up the tube. And it seemed nuts. I mean, this just seemed absolutely wild and unbelievable. She said she wanted Eisenhower dead. Now, Eisenhower was an old man, and he had been battling uh, heart condition, etc. But within 10 days, Eisenhower is dead. She said she wanted Everett Dirksen dead. He was a politician in the 60s. He died. And I began to realize that she either she had future vision or she was somehow causal in these happenings on this plane. Well, she, she had a lot to say about extraterrestrials. I won't go into all of it. But I realized that she was a violent and, and cruel person that uh, tortured me three days of no sleep, of uh, violent, suddenly she'd throw a cup of scalding coffee on me. She once threw an iron skillet across the kitchen, hit me in the face, and tore open my face. She, she was a, 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 a really a wicked person with this ability to heal. She had this dual nature and this connectedness to ETs in some way or other. Well, here's a story that I, I mentioned that I know relates to a screen memory. We're driving across Texas. Uh, this is 1970. And we were headed toward San Diego, taking the southern route. There's a a span of 150 miles before El Paso where there's nothing but desert. At least then that was true. In fact, there's a the, the gas station before you enter that stretch of desert is called Last Chance Gas. So we gassed up, headed out, a moonless, black, star-filled night on a two-lane truck road. We're on the road for about a half hour, and... I was watching with binoculars. It looked like spaceships coming down from the sky and getting in a row, like streetlights at a distance. But I was watching these lights, and I said, what, do you, what is that? What are those? Well, she had no explanation for it. The road changed, and now it we're on, it's going steeply up, and it had a... It was scooped like it was designed for high-speed vehicles. It had high walls. And every now and then we go under a bridge that were very flat, thin, and the under structure of the bridge was like a geodesic dome, interlocking triangles. The road went up and leveled out. The sides went down. And I'm looking at a city if you told me it was a thousand years from now, I would have believed it. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen. It was staggeringly, dumbfoundingly beautiful. A building that was maybe 200 stories tall, that looked like it was one apartment thin, that wrapped around in a, a big sea. Big, tall thin building, glowing with green light. Another building that looked like an oatmeal box sliced with a cleaver at, a, at an extreme angle. So there were like a lot of terrorist apartments that would have been available. Uh, a needle, a space needle that went up oh, 400, 500 feet and about at two-thirds of the way up, there was a huge platform and this thing looked like it was just physically impossible that this platform was balanced on this very thin needle structure. And in the sky, close to that, there was a flying saucer that I studied 
at close range, I mean, but I could see the windows, golden windows in a purple saucer. And man, it was, I, I was giddy. This is what I had always wanted, a real life experience that was out of, out of uh, Buck Rogers. I mean, this was, anyway, I'm, I am giddy with excitement. Audrey was frightened. I had never seen her frightened before. And I said, what's wrong? And she said, I don't know if we're going to be able to get back. She thought we had gone through a dimensional door, that we were in future time, and that we might not be able to get back. I, I was recording what I was seeing on a little reel-to-reel battery-powered tape recorder. I dropped the microphone, and I reached down and fished it out of the, off the floor. And I looked back up, and we're on a two-lane truck road. Just like that, it, it disappeared. And Jeff, do you think... Okay. Do you think, I mean, and I know for the audience listening, they're going to think, well, this guy was on a bad acid trip, but I've heard weird things like this before, and it's usually people have been abducted, and they'll have some weird memory, and then they'll get go get hypnotized, and it was completely different from what they remember. Um, do you think that will, that's what was going on? Yes. Yeah, I think that, I think that it was a stream memory. Uh, what Whitley Strieber says is that when we are abducted, we are given a memory from their planet, from their life experience that to, to cover what it was really going on. Now, I also remember from that trip, we had stopped looking at a map. And I remember bright lights and two beings walking toward us. One went to her, one came to me. And what I remember was he was a kind of a, a yokel uh, policeman, like a, almost like a Barney Fife from the Andy Griffith show. And we, he borrowed a cigarette and we, we were smoking and talking. And well, that could have well been part of that whole experience of uh, being abducted. But in the, in the course of that experience in the desert with the city, there also was, there were a lost, lost couple hours that uh, when we were back on the truck road, it was middle of the night as opposed to nine o'clock at night when we started. And again, that's, that's part of what is talked about. Another time we were driving and we wound up on a corduroy road, uh, bumping along on logs, very rough. And we came upon a cabin, a log cabin that was straight out of Abe Lincoln on this corduroy road. And at that point, I think we were either gone through a time warp backwards or another abduction experience with her. But I, the, the city of the future experience was so vividly physical. Uh, the, the feeling of the road underneath us, the perfectly smooth roadway. And oh, there, there was something along the side of the road. You remember in uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, how the fellow kept building the mountain? Out yeah. of mashed potatoes and so forth. Well, I saw this. That, that's something that that happened to me. That I I keep. I'll find myself drawing with my finger. This image of a, a, a disc, uh, like a like a almost like a radar disc, with uh, steel or, or metal going down to a point with a red light on the end, and these were along the roadway every mile or so. Who knows what they were, but they were part of the cityscape. And I have been hypnotized and they, they couldn't get past 
um, that memory. Interesting. So this lady that you became friends with, Audrey, um, and before we go into any more experiences, do you, do you think she was human? It seems like she's doing a lot of weird things that would make you kind of look at her and go, I don't know, she's from here. Uh, she was very human. Uh, she was. She claimed she was a hermaphrodite, both male and female. And I saw her seduce women. Uh, I mean, heterosexual women. Yeah, she was. She was very real, very physical. But I think she was plugged in. To I was just listening to a, a podcast talking about uh, magic and how with intention. Uh, people can create physical impact on the earth plane. So perhaps that's what she was using was some kind of magic to cause the death of, of people. I don't, I don't know. I know that she was violent and I, I came to see that she was operating out of a set of values extremely different than mine. And I began to put up Barriers, boundaries. You may no longer yeah. strike me. You may no longer uh, use violence against me. You don't need to yell at me. Speak normally. Speak quietly. And the more I exerted my own will, the greater I realized my capacity was to stand up for myself. Because she, she said she threatened my family. She said she would kill my family and me. And I'd seen her kill others, and I was I was terrified of that. So I, I would uh, she would say jump, and I'd say how high. I got jump. Well, the final experience uh, with her was she claimed that the she called it the the Casbah in Turkey. She said it was in Turkey uh, was the center of extraterrestrial control on this planet. And she was, oh, I've uh, got another, well, I'll do this one first. Uh, she said the cat, turkey must fall. And she took a frozen turkey out of the freezer and put it on the floor. She had 17 cats. And these cats began attacking the turkey. I mean, it was a really grisly thing to see these 17 cats ripping into this Turkey, especially as it became more defrosted. Well, representational magic, she was creating energy. She had intention. I don't know what else she did. But 12 hours later, there was a terrible earthquake in Turkey. 25,000 people were killed. And I, I was flummoxed. I, did, I had no idea whether she was causing it or whether she had seen it, uh, was able to see into the future and pretended that she caused it. But another, uh, another example, well, first of all, you asked, was she human? Uh, she did things that were, I had never experienced, well, healing my hand. Oh, I went back to the doctor, back to the original story. Two days later, he unwrapped the bandages. He looked at it. He went back to his notes. He came back. He said, I don't understand this. He said, I don't know what you did, but your hand is healed. I'll take out the stitches. He said, "It. this should not be. I don't understand this. He kept saying that. And I'd ask him, uh, when I first injured it, how long before I'd play guitar again? He said six months, maybe a year. I was playing guitar a couple of days later. So yeah, there was strange. that kind of experience. But then uh, early on living with her, she claimed that I was an energy vampire, that I was stealing energy from others around me. And I had no idea what that even meant. And I didn't believe it. I did not believe that such a thing was possible. Well, at one point she said to me, 
Oh, you're you're sucking some energy from me, huh? Well, go ahead, take a big drink. She would talk in that that style, and I did feel, you know, like when you have some couple of espressos and you get that excitation, that feeling of kind of a little speed rush. I, I felt that. I had that experience of like, wow, this feels good, this additional energy, whatever it is. And for just a moment, I imagined that there was a line of energy between us and that I was taking energy from her. And she said, okay, now I'm going to take it back. And instantly the good feeling stopped and I began to feel weak. My stomach felt like I was, it was filling up with blood for lack of a better term. That's what I thought at the time. This horrible sensation of ghastly energy sucking nausea. And my knees began to quake and I fell to the floor. And I knew that whatever she was doing, if she kept doing it, I was going to die. I knew she I knew she could kill me. And she stood over me, but she would just get I mean, literally her face would get black with with hatred and rage. And she got a mirror and held it up to me and I looked like an eighty year old man. My my cheeks were sunken, my eyes were sunken, there were my lips were puckered and uh, I, I just looked aged. And she said, I'm going to give you enough energy back that you can live. But just that. Well, she did, and we went on. So she she had paranormal power. She did... Things happened around her that I can't explain like that. Another time, we, we had lost our house. She hadn't paid the rent. And we were living in the woods near anyone who knows Southern California, the Torrey Pine National Forest. These ancient trees as old as the giant sequoias, but they're small, uh, bent pine trees of uh, the gnarled, but they're thousands, a thousand years old. And I was, we had a little kitchen set up outside. We had built a, a cabin that she was living in. I was living in a tent. And she was screaming and ranting and raving. She said, tonight I want a space bubble. Well, I thought, now I've got her. There's no, what is that? There's no such thing as a, a space bubble. So I thought, okay, it's it's good. I'm I'm solid. I know now that I will regain my foothold in reality, and she'll be proven to be a charlatan. Well, that night I'm out washing dishes in the in the dark. You get a moonless night, and I could oh the stars are magnificent, and I could see. I happened to look up, and there was a, a golden light that seemed to be coming out of one of the stars. And it, it got bigger and bigger until it was about the size of oh, a basketball at arm's length. And I went and I got Audrey. I said, come here, what, look at this. What? And we, we watched until it was the size of a watermelon. And then eventually the size of, it was, it was a quarter of the sky. And the bigger it got, the fainter it got. But you could see that it was an intact structural phenomenon of some kind. And she looked at me and she said, now do you believe me? <laughs> she had said there'd be a space bubble. Now do you believe me? And of course I was stunned into silence and lack of understanding, but realizing that once again she had proven that she had 
some grip on reality that I did not, and some connectedness that I did not. When I finally left her, I knew that she had, she had threatened my life and my family's life. But I was in touch with what uh, in Christianity is called the still small voice within. And that connectedness to my soul, uh, my connectedness to God, was strong enough that I was able to stand up to her. And by that time, there were 11 people in the house. And I knew that she she would uh, bring retribution down on people big time, steal from them, break into their homes. Uh, and I wanted to leave at a time when everybody would see that I was just. So I waited. I was in school, going to college, and I had a, a book to read and a, a book report to write that weekend. It was Saturday night. And she had taken up all my time all day long with her shenanigans, uh, teaching everybody, preaching about one thing or another. And I said to, to the room, I've got to, uh, I'll do the dishes, but then the rest of the weekend I've got to study. So after dinner I went in and started studying. And she came in and said, well, we're waiting for you. I said, well, I told you that I, I can't. I'm, I've got to read this book, and I'm reading with a magnifying glass, my face pasted to the page, extremely slow and difficult reading. And uh, with that, she grabbed the edge of my desk and hurled it across the room, uh, breaking my desk lamp, and uh, my girlfriend had given me a, a sake set that fell and smashed to the floor. And with that, I broke with her. I confronted her. I stood up, I said, I'm leaving, and we packed a few things and left. And uh, that was the end of it. Yeah, that's fascinating. It makes you wonder who this woman was, you know? I mean, a lot of the experiences you experienced are just, really, they're odd, very odd experiences. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, when you were five and you were taken, were you ever taken again? I mean, beyond the incident with Audrey yes. driving in Texas. Yeah, yeah I, another time that I, I know of. By the way, Whitley Strieber talks about how uh, abductees have a scoop of flesh missing, often in their shin or their calf, where there uh, is an implant, probably a tracking device, I would guess. And I have that scoop on my leg. And at one point, Audrey, uh, we were horsing around, and she picked me up, and I fell against a counter, and my a shin struck the edge of the counter, and by the next day, uh, blood poisoning was starting up my leg, and I, was, I went to the emergency room, and they dug something out of my shin. Uh, they said it was gravel. But who knows? I, I I don't know. But it was whatever it was. It was next to this scoop mark. So another time that I I, I know of for certain. I was teaching at uh, Kent State University. I developed curriculum for schools on acceptance of people who are different and forgiveness and uh, basically spiritual principles put into a secular context and music-based material. So an activity guide with songs and uh, a, a play and uh, a CD of music for young children and other things of that sort. And I would uh, stay on campus, near campus for a week. And because I was at that point uh, blind and couldn't drive, I mean, I'd never been able to drive, but as an accommodation, they put me up near campus for that week. And I always stayed in the same room in the same little crummy motel. And uh, so it went. I woke up in the middle of the night. As I said, I, 
Uh, in fact, I've taken courses on dream analysis, and I'm very, very in touch with dreaming and what it is to dream. I woke up, and this was as physical as uh, talking to you uh, in this moment. I was laying on a, a metal table, uh, or at least it, it felt metal, it was cold and hard, and over me there was a, a bank of lights, very, very bright lights that were in like, uh, oh, say a foot and a half cube or, or a rectangle square, maybe 10 feet across by 20 feet long. And it was, I had the sense that they were doing something, engaging, interacting with my body, reading it in some way, or in, in some way there was, they were engaged with me and I was paralyzed. I could not move and I was terrified. I, I could not call out. I couldn't move any muscle in my body. And I knew that uh, I, whatever was happening, I had no control. I passed out and woke up in the middle of the night back in my bed in the, in the motel. And I, I suspect that the measles were not normal measles. I think that uh, I was given that condition. When I was eight years old, I was hospitalized. They were trying to determine why I was going blind. And they gave me a, a bad, a dirty spinal tap. And from that, or at least I induced it was from that, but maybe not. Maybe this was part of the whole abduction, uh, in introduction of the virus. I developed uh, from the time I was seven until I was 14, what I'll call a, a plague of boils. I had these boils the size of oranges, horrible black infections that uh, would last for weeks uh, all over my groin and my legs. And to this, not to this day, but beginning about four years ago, I developed uh, eruptions on my left leg and my thigh like extreme acne uh, or boils that have multiple heads are called carbuncles. I've been to four dermatologists. No one can, they have no idea what it is. It's not bacterial. It's not viral. And they can't, they don't know how to treat it. And I, I think that it's all part of uh, the experience. I, I think it's all part of the abduction experience. The, what I have learned as I've studied all of this is that the reptilians uh, that have lived, that still live on the suffering of uh, people, and they eat people. They are the abduction. You, when, the, when people disappear, um, uh, woe, woe unto them, because my guess is it, if they're not eaten by Sasquatch, they're eaten by the reptilians. And I, I know that sounds as crazy as anything I've said, but I do believe that that is part of that aspect of the extraterrestrial experience. The other part is the saving part, and there's something called the abdro, abdro, ab, it's a It's one of the constellations. Ab, I'll think of it. Anyway, there, there's a council of extraterrestrials that are working to save the planet from the dark ones, and we're winning. The light is winning. So the extraterrestrial, the, the, the reptilians 
I just heard a podcast about this. They had 15 undersea bases. And I told you I saw a spaceship go into, into the ocean. Uh, those have all been destroyed. And there was an underground uh, base from Washington to Virginia. Do you remember when there was an earthquake in Washington a few years ago? A very strange thing, that, not earthquake country, but there was a, a significant earthquake in Washington, D.C. That was the destruction of that underground base. And there's still some reptilians in, in other smaller uh, caverns deep underground that, that still are living on the torture, the suffering, and the, and the physical bodies of humans, especially children. But, uh, you know, I know this is, uh, I know when you and I were talking the first time, you're like, this is crazy. I wouldn't believe it if I didn't hear, it. you know, if it didn't happen to me, I wouldn't believe a word of this. And of course, what I found, honestly, sometimes is sometimes the weirder things are closer to the truth than you might realize. Um, one question I want to ask you, and I'll definitely have you back, Jeff, for part two. Um, but one question okay. I want to ask you is, what, what do you think the aliens are? Do you think they're fallen angels? I know that's one theory. Uh, do you think they're um, uh, another life form from another universe? Do you think, what is your take on it? I think that, uh, first of all, that we've been visited, the Earth has been visited uh, for thousands of years by extraterrestrials. And I think they come from different planets throughout the galaxy, throughout the universe. And that they're here because of, well, for different intentions. But the, the ones that are malevolent are here not only because they want our suffering, but also they want the Earth's resources. And they're plundering the Earth's uh, rare minerals because their crafts too are physical. And they, yeah, I think, I think they are different species of beings that uh, come throughout the universe. It's a fascinating take on the whole thing, you know, and I and I really appreciate you coming on and sharing this portion of it. I, I'm definitely going to have you back for um, some of the demonic encounters and some more of the paranormal stuff that you experienced. Ab absolutely, yes. That's that's a whole other element of it, Wes. And I think that uh, it again goes back to intention. And I would just encourage everyone in your audience to. Uh, stay clear about your intentions, about working for uh, the, the spiritual principles that are universal and uh, getting away from technology and into your heart and into your inner life. Blindness has been a blessing to me because it's freed me from the exterior and opened my inner life, opened my inner uh, voice and my consciousness. So, as odd as it is to say it, uh, I I would not trade my blindness. Yeah, I understand completely what you're saying. Well, I appreciate you coming on again. Thank you again, Jeff. You're welcome, Wes, and thank you for having me. I look forward to the next time. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Until next time, everyone.
Save me from myself, let me drown 